God as listener. In the preceding lecture, I noted that the type of liturgical act most pervasive in the liturgy is that of addressing God. And I argue that the understanding of God implicit in those acts is God as one who listens. So let us now reflect on God as listener. In a subsequent lecture, we'll reflect on God as speaker. As I mentioned earlier, many theologians and philosophers have thought and written about God as revealer. Some, myself included, have thought and written about God as speaker. To the best of my knowledge, no one, myself included, has thought and written systematically about God as listener. So we're entering uncharted territory. The scholar's customary practice in dealing with a topic um, is to refine, deepen, criticize, correct, qualifying what other people have said on the topic. But that strategy with which I'm eminently familiar and comfortable is not available to me here. So I'm out on my own. <coughs> we can distinguish between the understanding of God's nature that is, <coughs> excuse me, implicit in our addressing God <coughs> and the understanding of God's disposition toward us that is implicit. The understanding of God's nature is that God is one who is capable of listening to what we say and who is free to respond favorably. The understanding of God's disposition toward us is that God is one who does listen. I'll be saying something about each of these. In the preceding lecture, we reflected on what it is to address someone. As preparation for our theological reflections on God as listener, let us now reflect on the pair, addressing someone and listening to someone's address to one. And recall that by listening to someone's address, I mean attending to it and grasping what was said. I'm a partisan of the speech action theory of speech. And the theory is well known to you here by virtue of Kevin, is well known to you here at Trinity. Um, let me do no more than remind you of the distinction that the theory draws between what J.L. Austin called locutionary acts and what he calls illocutionary acts because that distinction will be of fundamental importance for my discussion. An example of the distinction will serve our purposes here. No need to attempt definitions of these two types of acts, and I'm not sure that one can give an informative definition. So consider the sentence, the sun is shining, and its standard meaning in the English language. Suppose I utter or write that sentence with that meaning in mind and thereby assert that the sun is shining. My uttering or writing that sentence with that meaning in mind is a locutionary act and my asserting that the sun is shining is an illocutionary act. I could perform the act of uttering or writing that sentence with that meaning in mind without thereby asserting that the sun is shining I might, for example, utter or write the sentence in order to illustrate some point I wanted to make. In fact, that's what I've just done. Conversely, I could assert that the sun is shining without uttering or writing that sentence with that meaning in mind. I could do so by uttering or writing a synonymous sentence from English or from some other language. I take it that what these points show is that, in the case imagined, it was indeed two distinct acts that I performed. One, the locutionary act, the other, the illocutionary act. My locutionary act is in part perceptible. Someone can hear my utterance or observe my inscription of the sentence. Though, of course, they cannot hear or see my doing it with that meaning in mind. My illocutionary act of making an assertion is entirely imperceptible. It's not a universal, it's a particular, but it's an imperceptible particular. Now the relation between these two acts of mine, the locutionary and the illocutionary, is not merely that I performed them simultaneously, though certainly I did, 
their relation is that I performed the illocutionary act by performing the locutionary act. Now, one way in which we perform one act by performing another is by doing something that causes a certain event. For example, I can perform the act of turning on the light by performing the act of flipping the switch. And I do so when my action of flipping the switch causes the event of the light going on. The connection be between my locutionary act and my illocutionary act is not causal. My locutionary act does not have as one of its causal powers that it brings about my illocutionary act. The connection is rather what I've called in some of my writings a counting as connection. My performance of that locutionary act, uttering the sentence, counts as my making that assertion. In this case, the reason it counts as that is that there is a convention in effect according to which my performance of that locutionary act of uttering the sentence with that meaning counts as my performance of the act of asserting something. In various writings of mine, I've developed a theory of what it is for one act to count as another. For our purposes here, that certainly won't be necessary. Enough to note this, that my illocutionary act occurs outside the causal order. My performing that locutionary act was an exercise of non-causal agency on my part. I caused the locutionary act, but that counts as the illocutionary act. It doesn't cause it. Now suppose that, addressing you, I perform the illocutionary act of saying, look how beautiful the sky is today. And that I do so by performing the locutionary act of uttering the English sentence, look how beautiful the sky is today. Then for you to listen to what I said to you, it is to attend to it and grasp it, is for you to gain cognizance of my illocutionary act. And thereby the two of us are linked. This particular illocutionary act of my saying, look how beautiful the sky is today, is an act to which I stand in the relation of performing it and to which you stand in the relation of listening to it. That we human beings are capable of being linked in this way, capable of gaining cognizance of the illocutionary acts performed by our fellows, imperceptible particulars that lie outside the causal order, both those illocutionary acts addressed to us and those not, that we are able to gain cognizance of such acts is remarkable. That we routinely gain cognizance of such acts, such entities, goes beyond, I think, the remarkable. It's, when you think about it, astonishing. Now for some comments on what I call the normative dimensions of addressing and listening. It happens not infrequently that we ref refrain from listening to what is said to us or listen to just enough of it to know that we don't want to listen to any more of it. And one reason for this is that we don't have time to listen or strictly speaking, we judge it best not to take the time. Email messages addressed to me come flooding into my computer. I just don't have the time to read them all. Or precisely, I judge that I've got more important things to do than read through each and every one of them. There's nothing particularly revelatory of the nature of listening in this reason for refraining from listening, that, that we don't have the time. Most things that we do take time, and so we decide what to do and what not to do. Now for another reason for refraining from listening to what someone says to one. Sometimes one person refrains to listen to what another is saying to her because she regards it as beneath her dignity to do so. Some years ago, an American aunt of mine married a Dutchman and they moved to The Hague. At first, my aunt knew almost no one in the church they attended. Nonetheless, after a service, she did what she was in the habit of doing back in the US. 
she greeted the people around her. According to my aunt, one of the people she greeted, a well-dressed woman, drew herself up and in a voice dripping with sarcasm said, I'll translate from the Dutch, I do not have the honor of knowing you. My aunt did not hear this as an invitation to become acquainted. <laughs> she heard it as saying, who are you to be talking to me? Of course, there was some irony in the fact that the woman had, in fact, not only listened to what my aunt said, but had replied, though in such a way, indeed, as to signal that my aunt was not again to address her. The same reason for refusing to listen to someone is rather often used as a reason for refusing to speak to someone. Mary refuses to speak to Matilda but she regards, because she regards Matilda as so inferior to her as to make it inappropriate to speak to her, shameful, perhaps even wrong. Matilda is of a lower social class and untouchable, or she's one of those repulsive immigrants who somehow managed to get into the country or she has acted in an utterly despicable manner. Whatever the reason, for Mary to speak to her would require ignoring the great discrepancy in perceived worth between herself and Matilda. It would amount to Mary treating Matilda as having more worth than Mary thinks she does have. She's not worth speaking to. An emergency of some sort may make it necessary for Mary to speak to Matilda, but if she does, each party realizes that a certain equalizing has occurred. In speaking to Matilda, be it under duress or not, Mary honors her, grudging and temporary though that honoring may be. Sometimes it's for the opposite reason that one person refrains from addressing another. She regards the other as too far above her in worth or status. She doesn't dare speak to him. Who is she? An untouchable to address a member of the upper class. Who is she, a mere commoner, to address the king? It would be unthinkably presumptuous for her to do so. Suppose now that the social conventions are broken. Suppose that the king addresses the commoner, speaks to her, speaks kindly to her. The king has not been misled or deluded into thinking that she's not a commoner nor has he forgotten that he's a king. Nonetheless, he treats her as somebody worth speaking to. Thereby, he honors her. Seen from his side, he has humbled himself. Seen from her side, he has elevated her. Who am I, O king, that you would speak to me, she thinks. Other members of the royalty regard themselves as above speaking to her, and they regard her as beneath their speaking to. They don't approve of the social equalizing implicit in the king's action. Now suppose that the king not only speaks to her, but invites him to speak, her to speak to him. She does, and he listens. Thereby he treats her as someone worth listening to. He honors her. Seen from his side, he has once again humbled himself. Seen from her side, he has once again elevated her. Who am I, O oh king, that you would listen to what I've got to say, she says. Other members of the royalty regard themselves as above listening to her and regard her as beneath their listening to. They sternly disapprove of the king's action. So the combination of one person addressing another and the addressee listening to what the addresser says constitutes a mutual honoring. The speaker may be reluctant to treat his ad addressee as worth speaking to, and the addressee may be reluctant to treat the speaker as worth listening to, but mutual dignity, recognition of dignity, is built into the addressing listening, addressing, listening relationship. Sometimes if a person refuses to speak to another for a reason, a reason quite different from the two that I've mentioned, namely lack of time and disparity of social status. Sometimes a, ref a person refuses to speak to another because he's deeply alienated from him. The young man has flouted the will of the father so seriously or brought such shame on the family that the father turns him out 
and refuses henceforth to speak to him. Or the brothers are so angry with each other that they refuse to speak to each other. I once witnessed the following near incredible piece of behavior. I was in the, in the office of a philosophy department, along with two other members of the department, one of whom was not on speaking terms with the other. The secretary of the department, let's call her Nancy, that was not her real name, was seated at the desk. The person who was not on speaking terms with the other member of the department found herself in the position, nonetheless, of wanting to communicate something to him. So what to do? Here's what she did. She addressed the secretary and said, Nancy, would you tell so-and-so that such-and-such? So-and-so standing nine feet away. Just as, as it often happens that one person is not on speaking terms with another, so too it sometimes happens that one person is not on listening terms with another. If the latter person says something orally to the former, she covers her ears. If the latter writes a letter to the former and the former discerns who wrote the letter, she rips it up without reading it. What these examples point to is that both addressing and listening presuppose a certain degree of non-alienation from each other, a certain degree of toleration, if not exactly of harmony. One person may be intensely angry with another, but if he nonetheless, nonetheless speaks to her, even if only to express his anger, his alienation is not quite complete. It remains less than what it could be. Or if he nonetheless listens to her, then too his alienation is somewhat less than complete. This is inherent in the very structure of addressing someone and in the very structure of listening to what someone says to one. So now to God listening. It's astonishing that God would listen to what we say to him. God is the creator and sustainer of our incredibly vast and intricate universe with its astounding diversity and order. You and I are mere specks within this cosmos. Why would God bother to listen to what we say to him? Time is not an issue. God has all the time in the world. But given the enormously important things that God has to do as creator and sustainer of this universe, uphold the inconceivably vast starry heavens, preserve the intricate interplay of some atomic particles, keep the proteins in the bodies of animals working properly, just to mention three things. Given all those big important things to do, why would God bother to listen to us? Indeed, why would God bother to make creatures who can speak to him and to whom he can listen? Recall the words of the psalmist. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them? Angels, for all I know, they might have something to say to God that's worth God's attention. But we human beings, that the creator and sustainer of the universe would find it worthwhile to listen to us is something that we should find to be utterly astonishing. Evidently, God places great store on listening to what we say to him. Otherwise, why would he bother given all that he's got to do as creator and sustainer? But what could that great store be? Our order of discussion has been from creatures to God. To understand what is involved in our addressing God and in God listening to what we say to him, we looked at what it is to address a fellow human being and what it is for him to listen to what we say to him. The order of things is the opposite of my order of discussion. The order of things is that the God who is capable of listening to speech acts made by cre capable of listening to speech acts made creatures who are capable of such listening. Creatures who thereby image God in their capacity for such listening. To bear the image of God, to bear the image of God is to be capable of attending to and grasping speech acts. 
In listening to speech acts, we do, we image what God does. It's our bearing the image of God that the psalmist was pointing to, obviously, when he continued, you've made human beings a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. Part of our glory and honor is that we can speak. Let's look more deeply into what it is for God to listen to what we say to him. And to do so is to be yet more astonished that God would do such a thing. By listening to our praise, our thanksgivings, our intercessions, our blessings, our confessions, God unavoidably links himself to us. The very same speech act that we address to God is one that God listens to. God is of unsurpassable greatness. Our speech act is a puny, transitory, circumscribed, and defective thing. By listening to what we say to him, the unsurpassably great God brings it about that this puny, defective act of ours becomes a link between us. And that's astonishing. There's something yet more astonishing in the fact that God listens to us. God is high and mighty exalted above all the hosts of heaven. We are creatures of the earth, from dust to dust. Yet God listens to us. To do so is to treat us as worth listening to, to honor us, to pay us the honor of listening to us. Who are we, O oh God, that you would listen to us? Puny though we be, God does not regard it as beneath God's dignity to listen to us. Seen from God's side, God humbles himself. Seen from our side, God elevates us. Recall the hymn to Christ in Philippians 2. Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. In humbling himself by taking on our nature, Christ exalted us, and we now have the dignity of having the same nature as Christ. I submit that the humbling and exaltation that occurs, that occur when God listens to what we say to him, should be seen as a sort of foreshadowing of the humbling and exaltation that occurred at the Incarnation. The psalmist was a fair aware of that foreshadowing humbling. Psalm 86 opens with the plea, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. And in Psalm 138 he says, though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. There you have it exactly. Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. A Jewish writer, Yohanan Moss, in a little book, fascinating little book that he calls The Personhood of God, Biblical Theology, Human Faith, and the Divine Image, makes the following remark. One should not take this display of interest by God for human beings too lightly, for the true turning of God toward man was a total revolution in the religious world of the ancient Near East. The gods of Babylonia were completely dependent on nature and fate. Their major interest was in themselves, the satisfaction of their needs, their hates, their loves. The gods of Babylonia were not interested in the private destiny of human beings. To satisfy their physical needs, they turned to the king. God's listening to what we say to him obviously presupposes that God takes an interest in us. And what I've been arguing is that God's interest in us takes an utterly astonishing form. It takes the form of the creator and sustainer of the universe, treating us as being worthy of listening to, thereby honoring us. It takes the form of the one who is exalted above all the hosts of heaven, humbling himself, and simultaneously elevating us, creatures of dust. It takes the form of the one who is unsurpassably great, linking himself to us by listening to that very same puny, 
transitory circumscribed defective speech act that we performed, namely the speech act that we addressed to God. But is it not effrontery of mind-blowing proportion to address God in the conviction or expectation that God will listen? Commoners don't dare address the king. They're much too lowly. Beholding the king when in his presence, praising him and obeying him when he's out of their presence, they dare to do that. But they don't dare address him. Who do we Christians think we are? Addressing God when enacting our liturgies. And who do we think God is if we think that God's going to listen to us? Should the commoner get it into his head to address the king, the king won't listen. His status is too elevated. He's got more important things to do. Doesn't our action of addressing God in the conviction or expectation that God will listen imply a shockingly low view of God? Well, one reason the church believes that it is not effrontery for us to address God in the conviction or expectation that God will listen is that it believes that the Psalms included in its sacred scripture are not just a record of some old Jewish prayers, but a gift of God to the Jews down through the ages and then also to the church to be used by the church, both as storehouse and model for its own prayers. Now, the great majority of the Psalms take the form of address to God. The church takes the words of these Psalms on its own lips, not to recite them as one might recite some Shakespearean sonnet, but so as to address God thereby. Our locutionary act of taking on our lips the words of the ancient psalm, usually with considerable changes of meaning, our doing that counts as our locutionary act of here and now addressing God. And over and over, dozens of times, sometimes with great urgency, sometimes with evident con confidence, sometimes in worried tones, the psalmist says, Hear my prayer. Hear, O Lord, answer me. Incline your ear. Make haste to answer me. Hear my voice. Answer me when I call. Give ear to my cry. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable to you. The opening of Psalm 55 is especially emphatic. Give ear to my prayer, O Lord. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me. Answer me. I said that the church in enacting its liturgies addresses God in the confidence or the expectation that God will listen. These cries of the psalmist, attend, listen, hear, taken by the church onto its own lips, would appear to belie this claim on my part. It appears that the psalmist, rather than addressing God in the confidence or expectation that God will listen, is beseeching God to listen and doing so in worried tones. But that can't be the right interpretation. The psalmist's cry is not addressed to some angels asking them to get God to listen. The psalmist's cry is addressed to God. Why cry to God if you don't think that God will listen? The psalmist's cry is not a cry for God to listen to his praise, his intercession, his confession. He's assuming that God will listen. His cry is a cry to God to respond favorably to his praise, his intercession, his confession. Answer me is his cry, but it's addressed to God. Answer me when I call. Hasten to answer me. Another reason the church believes that it is not sheer effrontery for us to address God is that it believes that God has explicitly invited us to do so. Suppose that the king invites the commoner to address him. That is not presumption on the part of the commoner to address the king, but it's grateful acceptance of the king's offer. The Gospel of Matthew reports Jesus as saying to his disciples, pray in this way 
whereupon Jesus offers the paradigmatic prayer. The church interprets what Jesus said to his disciples concerning prayer as God's word to us. Addressing the creator and sustainer of the universe would indeed be sheer presumption on our part, were it not for the fact that the creator and sustainer has invited us to do exactly that. But isn't it pointless for God to invite us to address him? God knows our every thought. So when we express our thoughts in uttered or written sentences, what more is there for God to know than God already knows? Other than the fact, insignificant from God's perspective, that we do it in English rather than Dutch or French or something like that. The idea implicit in this question is that to speak, is that to speak is to express one's thoughts in some physical medium. Interpretation then being seen as moving in the reverse direction, from physical medium back to thought expressed. The combination on this way of thinking, the combination of expressing one's thought in some physical medium and one's addressee interpreting those physical media for the thoughts expressed constitutes the communication or transmission of thoughts from speaker to addressee. This expression theory of speech and its correlative theory of interpretation were the common, was the common theory among the 19th century romantics and I think a lot of people still basically hold it. Speech is transmission of thoughts by way of some physical medium. Now we human beings have no other way of knowing the thoughts of our fellow human beings than by their expressing their thoughts in some physical medium, the ideas, and by our interpreting that medium for the thoughts expressed. But, so the argument goes, God already knows our thoughts before we express them, and whether or not we express them. So what could possibly be the point of God inviting us to address him? I see speech act theory as helping us to see that this question rests on mistaken assumptions. To speak is to perform some illocutionary act. When speaking, one usually does express some thought or feeling. When I promise you to do something, I usually intend to do it. And my promise is an indication or expression of that intention on my part. But, here's the point, my promising you to do something is not to be identified with my expressing my intention to do it. When I promise you to do something, I take onto myself the obligation to do it. By contrast, just having the intention to do it doesn't make me obligated to do it. And just letting you know that I've got the intention doesn't make me obligated. In short, the fact that God knows our inmost thoughts does not render it pointless for us to perform the illocutionary act of addressing God. Addressing God is not the same as expressing a thought. And now, does God listen unconditionally? When enacting the liturgy, we follow the model of the psalmist and address God in the confidence or expectation that God will listen. But are there no conditions on God's listening? Does God listen no matter what? Is it possible that our confidence that God will listen is misplaced? Earlier I took note of the fact that the alienation of one person from another is sometimes so severe that the former refuses to speak to the latter. She's not on, as we say, on speaking terms with him. As we also saw earlier, alienation can also find expression in one person refusing to listen to the other. She's not on listening terms with him. May it be that God is sometimes so alienated from us as not to be on listening terms with us. May it be that sometimes God turns a deaf ear to what we say. Not just a deaf ear to that psalmist cry to respond favorably to our intercessions, but a deaf ear to the intercessions themselves. When participating in the liturgical actions of addressing God, this radical possibility is pretty much excluded from consideration. One has to stand outside the liturgy to take the possibility seriously. 
And that's what the Old Testament prophets sometimes did. Recall once again the well-known passage from the prophet Amos that I quoted earlier, in which God is the speaker. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I won't look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and doing what is right like an ever-flowing stream. I, God, despise your worship services. I take no delight in your liturgies. I won't attend to what you say. I won't listen. That's the truly radical possibility. Not only will God not respond favorably to what is said to him, that's bad enough. The alienation is so deep that God won't even listen. And what was it that so deeply alienated God from Israel and Judah that God refused to take notice of their rituals? After Amos had pronounced judgment on the surrounding peoples of Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab for their transgressions, the prophet turned his withering gaze on Israel and Judah and pronounced judgment on them for their transgressions in vivid language. You trample on the poor. You take from the poor levies of grain. You push aside the needy in the gate. You turn justice to wormwood. It's the rampant injustice in Israel and Judah that caused God's alienation. Not only will God bring judgment upon them, the alienation is so deep that God will pay no attention to what they do in their worship services. God won't even listen. So God's being on listening terms is not unconditional. God can become so deeply alienated from us that God refuses to listen to what we say to him. Rampant injustice alienates God. Seeking to do, even while failing, seeking to do what is just and right is a condition of God's listening. Not only does this tell us something of fundamental importance about God, the most general thing it tells us being that God is one to whom you and I bear all sorts of normative relationships. It also tells us something of fundamental importance about the Jewish and Christian liturgies. As I noted in my second lecture, from some of the things Amos says, one infers that Israel thought of participation in his liturgy as pleasing God. The people assemble to offer sacrifices, sing songs, play instruments, recite prayers, and so forth, on the assumption that God likes that kind of thing. It's not clear from what the prophet says whether the people thought of this as compensating for God's displeasure over what they were doing in their everyday lives, or whether they thought that God was indifferent to what they were doing in their everyday lives, but God really liked these, um, these rituals. Either way, they assume that the rampant injustice in their everyday lives would not detract from the delight that God gets from the songs they sing, the drums they beat, the sacrifices they make in their solemn assemblies. The prophet rejects out of hand this understanding of the liturgy, doesn't argue about it. Implicit in the prophetic denunciations is that liturgy is not something one does in addition to living one's life in the everyday, but that liturgy is for giving expression to a life committed to love of God and neighbor, a life committed to seeking justice and to doing what is right. In the absence of such a life, liturgy has no point. It's a charade, it's going through the motions. Worship while pleasing to God does not obviously require perfection in one's life. We openly confess our sins to God. What it does require is what the psalmist called a broken and a contrite heart. When our address to God is the expression of a humble heart, committed to love of God and neighbor, then God listens. Sacrifices so offered are what the psalmist calls right sacrifices. In such sacrifices, God delights. Here's the general point. No matter how faithfully one follows the script, one's participation in the liturgy can be malformed. Malformed so seriously that God refuses to listen. It can be theologically malformed. 
over and over in the history of the church, one party has accused another of enacting a theologically malformed liturgy. But that's actually not the sort of malformation the prophets emphasized. They emphasized what you might, might call moral malformation. The sort of malformation that occurs when one's addressed to God is insincere because it's so fundamentally out of accord with one's conduct in the everyday. So when we participate in the liturgy, we place ourselves on the hook. We render ourselves subject to judgment. To quote a friend of mine, the moment we open our mouths by singing praises, we're in danger of doing so in bad faith. And hence it is that in many liturgies, the concluding words of Psalm 19 occur somewhere in the liturgy. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The forgiveness for which we ask God, for which we ask God, thus, is not just forgiveness for the defects in our lives in the everyday. Um, it also includes forgiveness for the defects in our participation in the liturgy. There remains the most important question of all. Why does God invite us to address him? And when we do, why does God listen to what we say? I've done my best to evoke a sense of how astonishing it is that God listens to us. But the more astonishing we find it that God listens to us, the more pressing becomes the question, why? Why does God invite us to address him? And when we do, why does God listen to what we say? The answer to this question differs a little bit depending on the particular content of the address. When we praise or bless God, we acknowledge God's unsurpassable glory. When we thank God, we acknowledge God's unsurpassable love for us. Each of these is the acknowledgement of some aspect of God's unsurpassable greatness. Having praised, blessed, or thanked God, we then ask God to accept our acknowledgement of God's unsurpassable greatness in spite of the inadequacy of our address. So here's the question. Why would God invite us to acknowledge his unsurpassable greatness? And when we do, why would God bother to listen to what we say? A Nietzschean would regard this as a prime indication of the narcissism of the Christian God. But that's to look at things from the wrong end. It's not because God revels in listening to his greatness being acknowledged that God invites us to praise, bless, and thank him. It's because we, who have come to know God, want to acknowledge God's greatness. And it's because of that that God invites us to be free, feel free to do so. In spite of the extreme ontological disparity between us, and in spite of the inevitable inadequacy of what we say. It's important to us, crucial to our shalom. So God says, feel free to praise me. The commoner wants to praise the king to his face, not just behind his back. But she, a mere commoner, doesn't dare address him. The king, seeing her hesitation, invites her to do so. She does and concludes by saying that she hopes the king will accept her in adequate words. The king listens carefully to what she says. She wants to address the king. There's an additional point to be made here. In several of the Psalms, the psalmist enjoins God's non-human creatures to praise God. Psalm 148 is a great example. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds. Now the psalmist knows that God's non-human creatures cannot literally praise God on their own. So the psalmist praises God on their behalf. That's what he's doing when he enjoins them to praise God. He's giving voice to their praise. So let's turn from the praise, blessing, and thanksgiving that we address to God to our confession of sins and our intercessions. 
Following our confession, we pray God to have mercy upon us and forgive us our sins. Thereby, we acknowledge that we have offended God and we appeal to God's forgiving love. Following our intercessions, we pray that God will hear our prayer, that is, deliver those for whom we have interceded from what threatens their flourishing. Thereby, we acknowledge our dependence on God and appeal to God's saving love. In the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me, says the psalmist. Why would God invite us to acknowledge our offense and dependence and appeal to his love? And why would God then listen to what we say when we acknowledge that we have offended him and are dependent on him? A Nietzschean, to bring a Nietzschean once again into the picture, would regard this as a prime indication of the wish of the Christian God to have us grovel. But I submit that this is once again to look at things from the wrong end. God does not, is not invite us to confess and intercede because God takes such great pleasure in listening to our acknowledgement that we've offended him and takes great pleasure in listening to our acknowledgement of our dependence. I submit that God invites us to feel free to confess and intercede because we, who have come to know how we stand with God, very much want to confess and intercede. How could we not want to do so? It's essential to our flourishing, our well-being, our shalom. So the king invites the commoner to feel free to do what she very much wants to do, namely ask for mercy and deliverance. And when she does, he listens to what she says. Thanks.